All right, are we ready for this? Good, because I guarantee sometime this month I'm going to offend or upset everybody. You can't do a subject like this, especially today when we start talking about sex. Oh, you didn't know that was going to be today, did you? That's just part of it. Um, but I, I just, I'm so excited about this series. As of this August, Alita and I will have been married 47 years. So, thank you. She deserves all of the credit. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Going to be a little too much of that going on, I'm afraid. So hear me when I say this, marriage is a blessing. Amen? Some of you are not eating lunch today because there was a... When I hear the slap of skin against skin because somebody didn't... Yeah, okay, all right. Marriage is a blessing, but not everybody feels like we do. It may be better to say... Marriage is a blessing when it's a blessing. And marriage is not a blessing when it's not a blessing. That was pretty profound, wasn't it? I know, you're probably all writing that down right now. (laughs) Marriage can be a great blessing when it is. But marriage can be painful and very complicated when it's not a blessing. And I didn't make this up, okay? In Proverbs chapter 18, verse 22, Solomon writes these words. The man who finds a wife finds a treasure. And all the men here are going, yes, absolutely. Thank you, Jesus. I'm giving you multiple opportunities to dig your way out of the hole that you're already in. And he receives a favor from the Lord. So it's a treasure, and we get the favor of God. So marriage is a blessing when it's a blessing, okay? Now, Proverbs 27, verse 15 A quarrelsome wife is as annoying as constant dripping on a rainy day. Drip, drip, drip. So marriage is not a blessing when it's not a blessing, right? So if I can kind of equal this out just a little bit, I I had to really search for this one. I found it in the book of 1 David, chapter 7, verse 2. It is better to have a kidney stone than to marry a man who's a self-centered jerk. And you're going, I've never seen the book of 1 David in my Bible before. Um, that's found in the book of opinion. The letters are B-O. You know? <laughs> Got it? Yeah. It's not really a Bible verse, okay? But in my opinion, it ought to be. Um, what I'm trying to say again is marriage is a blessing when it's a blessing. And marriage can be painful and complicated when it's not a blessing. So we're starting a series today entitled, What Does God Think About Marriage, Singleness, and Our Relationships in General? And then I had to add that one line underneath when I was putting this stuff together. Do we care? Do we care what God thinks about marriage? Do we care about what God thinks about singleness? Do we care what God thinks about all of our relationships? The aim of this series is going to be, first of all, For those who are not married, that's going to be the focus of next week. We're going to spend some time talking about that. And you may be sitting there going, well, that's not going to apply to me. And I'm just going to say, if it doesn't apply to you, then you have friends to whom it will apply. So I will be giving you some very useful tips that you can bring out. The Bible actually says that singleness can be a gift. I wondered if anybody was going to say amen. (laughs) I was going to see who was very, very brave in this crowd this morning. Hmm. I know you don't have any kids sitting with you, so you two better be good. Mm -hmm. So what we want to do is we want to help you that are single to be single in a way that honors God. If you're dating, we want to help you date in a way that honors God. If you're married, You're figuring this out. We want to help you be married in a way that honors God. And part of this series is going to be answering some of the most often asked questions, and they're going to be very practical and specific. So there's two questions I want to deal with this morning. The first one, this is the most common question that comes up, is how do I find the right person? 
How do I find the right person? Where do I go? What do I do? Do I use a dating app? You know, there's Christian dating apps now. I, okay. Do I go to church and scan the crowd for somebody that doesn't have a wedding ring on? Okay. Do I go to the coffee shop and hang out with my Bible opened right in front of me, just hoping that the right person will come by and notice what a spiritual person I am? I've seen it, okay? You laugh. I've seen it, okay? Um, is dog walking a great way to meet people? According to Hallmark, it is. Come on, how many movies, you know, have we seen? They're walking dogs and, and all of that. But I think it's an interesting question, but I want to ask an even better and more important question, and that is, how do I become the right person? Not just how do I find the right person, but how do I become the right person? And the reason we want to ask this question is because we don't tend to attract what we want. We tend to attract what we are. After all these years? Just saying. We're going to talk more about that next week. And I'm actually next week going to give you three qualities that need to be developed before somebody gets married. And you may listen to them and say, oh, man, I wish we had done that. You know, you'll get a chance. This morning, I want to direct us towards what I think is a very foundational question. And this message is kind of laying the background for everything I'm going to talk about over the next several weeks. But the question I want to deal with today is what is marriage? And the reason this matters so much is that how we look at marriage shapes how we approach relationships. Can we go there? Thank you. How we look at marriage, you're going to want to write that down if you're taking notes because we're going to come back to this several times. How we look at, how we view marriage uh, shapes how we approach relationships. And you'll understand that. Um, now, in talking about marriage, a lot of people today see marriage as a simple contract between two consenting adults. I've done weddings for over 40 years, and at the end of the ceremony, the one thing that we always do is I gather the bride and the groom and the best man and the maid of honor, and we would all sign the marriage license, which is a legal agreement. It's a legal document. When I first started pastoring a couple of years ago, almost all weddings were conducted at church buildings. That was just the way you did it. Uh, but now, believe it or not, most weddings are done at wedding venues or in front of a justice of the peace or before a judge. Those three together, a lot more of those kind of weddings than church weddings. Um, but even in those situations, you still have to sign that piece of paper, which, which makes a lot of people think that that's really all marriage is. Just a piece of paper to be signed, it's just a contract. But according to what we read in the Bible, marriage is much more than just a legal agreement. Now Jesus jumps into this whole discussion in Matthew chapter 19. And so I'm going to read three verses for you. Matthew 19, verses 4, 5, and 6. And let's listen to what Jesus says about this. He says, Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female, verse 5, and said, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Verse 6. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. The point I would make from that is that marriage is from God. Marriage has been designed by God. So it's not just a contract. In fact, let's stop and talk about what a contract is. Okay, when you stop and think about it, what is a contract based on? Seriously now, a contract is based on mutual distrust right? Think it through with me. It's based on mutual detrust, distrust. We can't just give our word anymore in our culture, can we? We have to sign a contract. If you hire someone to remodel your house and there's a contract involved, what it's really saying is, I have to have some way of making sure that you do what you said you would do, which is what I'm paying you to do, right? Okay? 
It also means if you don't do what you said you would do, then I now have, in writing, a way to get out of this agreement. So a lot of people would look at that and say, well, if that's all marriage is, if it's just a piece of paper, then why bother getting married at all? We'll just save the money and live together, which has been increasing in popularity for quite some time now. Uh, and I have to say, honestly, that just from a logic point of view, that makes sense. And you're going, did the pastor just say that? If all marriage is to you is a piece of paper, then why not? Living together is more and is becoming more and more popular in our culture. My wife and I got married August the 14th, 1976, at the chapel of St. Louis Christian College in Florissant, Missouri. It'll be 47 years for us come August. I've already told you that. I'm kind of proud of that because she's put up with me that long. And I would say it is a real blessing to be married to your best friend. Thank you, sweetheart. Yeah, she's looking at me like, okay, where are you going with this? But I will, I will I, one of the things you need to understand about this whole series is that she will read every sermon before I preach it, okay? That way if I, and she'll know when I go away from the sermon. And, yeah, okay, yeah. Since the time that we got married, the percentage of adults who cohabitate has more than doubled. It's really increased incredibly. And according to the National Center for Family and Marriage Research, today, 80% of teenagers expect to cohabitate or live together before they get married. 80%. For kids growing up today, it just seems normal to them to think that the natural progression in their relational life would be to live together at some point. And honestly, I'm just going to say this, I don't blame them. Because it sounds like a decent plan if marriage is just a piece of paper. If it is, then you can split the responsibilities and enjoy the benefits. You can share your Netflix account so you can save money. You can split the, the chores and share the bed. The problem with this is that studies also show that living together actually decreases the odds of relational success. Got really quiet for that. Let me say that again. The studies show that living together actually decreases the odds of relational success. It doesn't work out as well as we all thought that it would, even if it makes sense if marriage is just a piece of paper or it's just a contract. Now, researchers have a fancy name for this. And I know you've come to expect me to give you big words and fancy titles, right? Let's go ahead and put it up on the screen. It's called the cohabitation inertia effect. That's a good one, isn't it? The cohabitation inertia effect. I thought I would throw that one at my wife the other day. She knew exactly what it meant. That's what, that's what happens when you marry a social worker. That's why her T-shirt says, God only uses broken people. <laughs> It's true. And she's looking at me going, you're deviating from the sermon. So what in the world does this mean? The cohabitation inertia effect. Follow me here. Instead of purposefully becoming more and more committed to each other, because you set out to do that, that's your purpose. Instead of purposely doing that, people who cohabitate or live together tend to just slide into a commitment instead of intentionally deciding to be more committed or deciding to go into that together. For instance, you might slide into, hey, why don't we just live together? It makes sense and it's a little cheaper. So you co-sign an apartment lease and you kind of slide into it. Now, are you both as committed to that as you say you are? Usually not. And then you think, okay, let's consolidate to one phone plan because we can save money, and you kind of slide into that. And then somebody says, let's get a puppy. And maybe you're not totally committed to that, but the other one is, so you get a puppy. And then one day the question will come up, whose puppy is it? Okay? And if you're not careful, the puppy becomes a kid. And then you've got a baby, and suddenly you are incredibly entangled with each other, but you're not fully committed. What that does is increase the pressure 
on the relationship. You may not be fully committed to that person, but now you're feeling kind of stuck. And the moment that you start feeling stuck but not committed, it decreases the odds of success in the relationship. Now, you never meant for it to get to this point, but, you know, you're both good people, right? And it makes sense, and you're not hurting anybody but yourselves. Yeah, it makes sense on paper, but the odds go down in having a really great relationship. Now, you don't even have to do the move in together thing, okay? You can do the playhouse thing, where you have a drawer at her place, and she has a drawer at your place. And practically speaking, you're pretending to be married. And you're doing married things, and when things don't go well, you break up. It's kind of like a divorce. And then later on, let's say you do get married, and you only see it as a contract or a piece of paper, if things don't go well, you take your drawer of stuff and go your way, and she takes her drawer of stuff and she goes her way. And maybe that's one of the reasons why so many marriages are not working out all that well today. And I wish I could tell you that the numbers are a whole lot different between Christian couples and the world's couples. They're not. Divorce rate's about the same now. Um, it's about the same thing. Now, please understand, I am not trying to pass judgment on anybody here or anybody that you know. And if you've known me for any length of time, that is the last thing on my mind. I want to help you. But what this all comes back to is what we looked at a moment ago. Can we put it back up? How we look at marriage. Thank you. Yeah. How we look at marriage shapes how we approach relationships. What you think of marriage is going to influence how you approach all your relationships. And what I want to show you today is what a Christian marriage is because it's more than a contract. It's more than a piece of paper. It's more than just the I love you's and I do's at a ceremony. But a Christian marriage is actually a covenant. And it's a covenant based on mutual commitment. Remember, a, a contract was based on mutual distrust. But a covenant is based on mutual commitment. Now, let's talk about that word covenant, because that's not a word we throw around very often in our daily conversations, is it? You know, like, oh, I'm going to go sign a covenant down at the bank. <laughs> nah, not usually. In the Old Testament, the word for covenant actually means a cutting. When there was a, when there was a covenant, there was always blood involved. And I want you to think about what that means, first of all, in the New Testament. Under the New Covenant, Jesus shed his blood so that our sins could be forgiven. So there was always a shedding of blood when there was a covenant, which when you read those words, what God has joined together in a holy covenant, let no one separate. Why? Because it's holy. It's a righteous covenantal commitment before God. I always like to say that word, covenantal like to say it. Now, let's go back to the Old Testament. This, this is really, think about this. This is what people understood for thousands of years. When two people would make a business deal, they would cut a bull in half, and they would lay the two halves on the ground with enough room to walk between them, and both of the people making the covenant would walk through the two halves seven times. Seven times you would walk through that mess. And then they would say to each other, if we break our word, may what happened to the bull happen to us. I would call that total commitment. Yeah, uh, you know, and it, when it comes to marriage, it's the I promise to be faithful to you for the rest of my life. Okay? So now, we've been waiting for this. Let's talk about sex. Oh, you guys are so scared. A bunch of scaredy cats. In a very well-respected study, and you don't have to agree with this. I've got the paperwork to prove these things, okay? In a very well-respected study, it, it said that men think about sex 19 times a day. Okay. <laughs> yeah, well, more than that. Yeah, I heard that. How many times a day do you think women think about sex? The answer is that women think about sex 
10 times a day. So if the men think about sex 19 times a day, and women think about it 10 times a day, it raises the question, what else do women think about? And the answer is food. I'm sorry. Yeah, chocolate. That would fit in there. Women think about food 15 times a day. So if you're tracking with me, women think about food more than sex, and men think about sex more than women think about food. Which leads to the question, and you would have never come up with this question because I'm the one who's coming up with it. How do we live with sexual integrity in a culture of sexual brokenness? How do we do it? And the answer to that question is what we have to remember, that it all depends upon how you look at marriage. Because how you see marriage shapes how you approach the subject of sex. So what do we know about marriage according to scriptures? Scripture teaches that a Christian marriage is a covenant between a man and a woman for life. It says in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4, marriage should be honored by all. Meaning if you're not married, you honor marriage. If you are married, you honor the covenant of marriage. And then it says, and the marriage bed kept pure. Scripture teaches the principle that the only kind of God-honoring sex is sex within the covenant of marriage. And I've had people say to me, Pastor, that doesn't leave us very many options. Meaning, if you're dating, what is it you can do and what is it you can't do? And I feel like I'm back in high school having to ask questions like that, okay? Uh, Scripture's pretty clear here. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 5. Verse 3, I think we've got that a slide for that too. Ephesians 5. It says, but among you, and he's talking specifically to believers. So do not try to take this and apply this to your friends who are not believers, all right? You're going to be very frustrated if you do. But among you, believers, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality. Not even a, what? hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed. Isn't it interesting that he adds greed into purity and sexual immorality? Because these are improper for God's holy people. Did he say they're unforgivable? No. He just said they're just not proper. It's, and this, what this brought back to my mind was uh, I went to a Christian college in Florissant and uh, lived in the dorms, which is always so, oh, there's so many stories that you come out of the, dorm, the dorms. And um, yeah, the main thing we loved to do was to go and attack the girls' dorm. Yeah, yeah. And figure out how we could get them out without them getting in trouble. And I think we learned how to do that, didn't we? Yeah. Just don't ask questions what happened on the first Easter Sunday morning that we were married. Because, you know, I... Oh, we weren't married yet. It should have been a lesson to me, right? It should have been. Uh, but we had to get up early and go because the church I was serving at had a, a sunrise service. And so, Alita, cool, calm, and collected, always ready, Alita. And she said, I'll be ready. Come and pick me up. Guess who was still sound asleep in bed when I got there? And so I think we had to figure, I knew what window was for her room, and I banged on the window and woke her up, and then I think I had to leave you, so I could, yeah, I had to come back and get her. Wasn't that really big of me? Uh, well, what I remember is being a freshman at college, uh, the upperclassmen, and remember, this is a Christian college, so there were some very stringent requirements the upperclassmen would talk to us newbies uh, and get, try to give us advice, and they would answer our questions. And uh, it was especially later on in the year, kind of a talk to those of us that were recently engaged. Because Alita and I did not waste any time. We started dating around the end of November, and by Valentine's Day, we were engaged, and by August, we were married. So we didn't want to waste any time. 
But the question that came up, and boy, this was taking me back to high school youth group, what was legal to do? What could we get by with and not make God mad? You understand how the mind of a, a you know, junior high, high school boy works? Uh, and, you know, so this was one of the questions that would come up when we were having this talk with the, uh, the upper class one. And the answer was, it's a very, 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 very short list. There wasn't much on that list because of how clear the scripture was in Ephesians 5, verse 3. No hint of sexual immorality. You see, this is God's standard because the gift of making love is so holy. It's reserved for the int intimacy of a covenant marriage. And because it's so holy, and because it's so intimate, and because it's so righteous, and because it's supposed to be so pure, there shouldn't be a hint of sexual immorality. So you're going, okay, Pastor, what would that mean? What would be out of bounds? Well, certainly adultery, right? That's more than a hint of sexual immorality. What about premarital sex? Well, that's more than a hint of sexual immorality. That's not something that you need to be doing. So someone might ask, and usually I've had this question brought to me, well, Pastor, what about like, you know, just like, you know, like not all the way, but like just everything else, you know, it's everything but just not like the final thing. That would actually be more than a hint of sexual immorality. When you look at God's standard, it's pretty stinking high. We could make the argument that crude sexual jokes might be a hint of sexual immorality. We could make an argument that dressing immodestly could be included as well, and watching certain videos or movies. And yes, I'm trying to pick on everybody. So if you feel like I haven't picked on you, come back, and I will find something to get you with, okay? Jesus was the one who said this. He said, if you even look lustfully at someone else, you're committing adultery in your heart. And I have always thought, man, that's heavy-duty stuff. The standard is so high that I can almost guarantee that none of us have kept it perfectly. Which reveals what? Our desperate need for Jesus. And our desperate need for his grace in our lives. These messages are not about condemnation. It's not about judgment. Without the forgiveness of God and the power of God, we would not be able to live a life that was pleasing to him at all. And I am so thankful for the forgiveness of God. So at this point, you might be saying something like, lighten up, past killjoy. Come on, I've got my needs, and, and it's not like we're back in the dark ages when you were young. You're so outdated, God must be a prude. Well, I got news for you. God is not a prude at all. I want you to understand that God is very pro-sex. And if you can't understand that, you've not read your Bible, Okay. Uh, if you don't believe me, try reading the Song of Solomon. We've gone through sermon series on those, some of us together. And I, I tell you, it's hard to preach that stuff without blushing and, and everything else. But we got through it, okay? And let me just be the first one to say I realize the church has not always gotten it right. The church has done a lot to make sex sound like it's nothing but dirty. So the subject of sex comes up. And what do we hear? Don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. And then you get married, and what do we hear? Go do it, go do it, go do it, go do it. I think sometimes the church sounds more like a light switch, you know? Turn it on, turn it off. And God is not saying no, 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 no. God is saying wait, 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 wait. Why? Because this is holy. This is righteous. This is a gift that's reserved for the covenant of marriage. God is not a prude trying to rob you of some fun. He wants to protect you because he loves you, and he wants to help you evo avoid some emotional and relational pain that others have gone through, and maybe you've already gone through some of it yourself. Why? Answer, because God cares about you. He loves you, and he wants to bless you. He wants to protect you, and he wants you to have something that's very special. 
Now, again, this is kind of an introductory kind of message, so let's slow down for a minute and let's just ask this question. Where are you today in the context of relationships? Let's talk about that for just a moment. The first thing I want you to know is that no matter what you've done, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Please understand that. So don't feel condemned. But if you are feeling convicted, whole different level, and maybe God is working on your soul, guess what? You can apologize to God. You don't understand. The reason I bring this up is because I served in a church. I think it was the second church I was ever youth pastor at where the pastor believed that if you committed certain level of sins, the only way that you could come clean about that was up in front of the congregation on Sunday morning telling everybody else what you had done wrong. Yeah, that's wrong. That is very wrong. That was not... I need to stop now or I'll say something I shouldn't say. Um, Gosh, yeah. But in my mind, what a great thing it is to be able to say, God, we messed up. God, would you please forgive us? God, from this point on, would you lead us? And you can let God forgive you. Maybe there's something you need to stop doing. He will help you with that. Maybe you need to put something positive in its place. God will help you with that. If you're single, you may be realizing that the person you're with is not really suited for you and your goals, and you're not going to stay in that relationship because you're not going to settle for something less than God's best. Trust me, that's going to change the way that you see marriage. For the first time, you may see that marriage is not just a contract or a piece of paper that you both sign, but marriage is a covenantal relationship where God can bless both of your lives. So instead of doing what most other people do, You can join those of us who have decided to be a little weird. Those of us who have decided to be different. And I'm going to tell you right now, people will make fun of you. They will. So instead of doing what they're doing, you, for instance, we have a weird marriage. We do, don't we? Probably... But it's a blessed marriage, and it's a happy marriage, right? I told you, it's happy. (laughs) See, when it comes to marriage, I don't want normal. Normal is divorce. Normal is broken. Normal is staying together because of the kids. If you want something different, you've got to take a different approach. And God's approach is incredibly different. You may be somebody sitting here this morning and nobody else knows this, but you're living in sexual brokenness right now. Emotionally and mentally, you wake up every day wrecked. So what do you do? Well, the good news is that anyone who is in Christ Jesus, the scripture says, you are a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. And you're not just made new spiritually, your emotions are renewed. And I would even say that I think you can be sexually renewed by the power and the grace of God. And you might be married right now and you're saying, wow, according to what you said, Pastor, we didn't do it right when we were dating. That's thunder, right? That's God saying, hey, man, Pastor, preach it. You You think of thunder the way you want to think of thunder? I'll think of thunder the way I want to think of Or you might be sitting here saying, you know what, we're not really doing it all right right now. So what do you do? Well, maybe the two of you could take hands together and turn to God and just say, God, would you forgive us? We've still got a lot to learn. And you could receive his forgiveness together. And you might even decide to get crazy together and pray together. Wow, that would be different, wouldn't it? You might even start doing a date night regularly. I have to fight this with my own kids, and they know better. And I'll ask them, when was the last time the two of you went out on a date? The last time you came down and watched the kids? <laughs> we gave them a whole week last week, didn't we? Two weeks ago, yeah. 
I want you to understand that our God is a God always giving second chances, third chances, and fourth chances. We've talked about this, but his grace is amazing. And there is no sin that is too great for the grace of God. I wish I could tell you that Alita and I have always been perfect, that we never needed to ask for God's forgiveness, but you're going to figure it out pretty quick. We're human just like you are. And God forgave us just like he will forgive you. So to us, August the 14th, 1976, we shared our covenant vows. And what God did is he united us in a holy covenant. Yes, his standards are so high, but yes, his blessings are worth it. So let's put that sentence up there on the screen one more time. It all comes down to this, how we look at marriage shapes how we approach relationships. Marriage isn't this practical arrangement. It's a spiritual covenant. Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning, the creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. If you're not married and you want to be married, or if you're single and you want to stay single, would you please do that in a way that honors God? If you're married, would you please be married in a way that honors God in your marriage? I want us to honor God in every relationship we have with whoever we have it with. Which leads me to our final question, and that is, do you have a relationship with God? I told you last week that we want the crosswalk to be a place where outrageous grace is exercised. The kind of grace that refuses to give up on those who have been trapped by sin and struggles, broken people. And God will do that because he refuses to give up on us. Oh, I so wish I could drive that point home. I don't know where you may find yourself today, but God is not going to give up on you. The crosswalk will be a triage for the wounded, where moral insurance is not checked at the door, but where all are welcome no matter who they are or what they've done. So I'm going to ask you to stand with me because we're going to pray. And I'm going to ask you to bow your heads, please. I want to invite you to pray with me so that you can, if you have not already, start a relationship with Jesus. And as is our custom here, I'm going to ask everybody in the room to pray this prayer out loud. And I want you to do that with me. All I ask as we do this is that you mean it with all of your heart. The Bible says if we confess that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that he has risen from the dead, we will be saved. So please, repeat this after me. Dear Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sin. Help me to live for you and to love you all the days of my life. Today I'm new. Today I'm changed. Today I'm forgiven. Today I'm free. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. And I hope you'll stick around after our final song because I don't want to eat ice cream by myself.